Well, still some impressive work you did at the ICTY, both of you. Um, so, um, so going back to our discussion, uh, now that we've seen the, some clips from it, uh, what what would you say? What would you say were the, some of the key features of the ICTY that distinguished it from, say, the domestic criminal procedures or other international fact-finding missions? Maybe Nena can answer first, and then followed by Patrick. Um, you, some of you might remember that in 1993 when the International uh, Tribunal for Former Yugoslavia uh, was founded by the UN, a Security Council of UN, not uh, uh, General Assembly, it was greeted uh, by liberals across the world as something very significant. And uh, there was no doubt at that time that it should be an international court and that it should be placed somewhere outside of the region. For obvious reasons, there was a war waging in the former Yugoslavia and um, the court was um, created and became operational in The Hague, the Netherlands. Um, so when it started to work properly, with many cases going on, and we are talking now the end of the 90s and the early 2000s, many victim witnesses were asked to come and testify. For some of them in the Milosevic uh, trial, for example, the villagers from Kosovo would n needed their passport issued for the first time in their life because they never left their li village before. So it actually opened up a discussion. What is the purpose of having such an alien court in a faraway country uh, for the constituency of victims that, per definition, ascribe the great expectation and meaning to the court? And I remember participating and some of these discussions and with arguments pro uh, against an international court uh, with proceedings held in English, yes, translated, but you know, translation is always different than a direct engagement that victims can follow it. And I was uh, sort of bouncing and shifting my positions on that for a very long period of time in this discussion, going from, yes, international criminal court was the only uh, workable and possible solution at the time, and then a regretting the end physical and mental and cognitive and even emotional distance it created to its biggest constituency in the region itself. And I must say that um, uh, bouncing from one argument to another, I completely came back to my initial understanding why an international court was important, and not least for the reasons important for the title of this conference. If you would have had national courts, they would never have the power international UN uh, court had in uh, compelling member states to produce needed documentation. And now in retrospect, the importance, and, and you might remember, some of you might even remember a huge um, uh, 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 discussion with, uh, with, with criticism of Yugoslavia tribunal being a UN court because UN forces were forces on the ground when the most of gravest crimes were happening. So the whole idea was how could UN found a court while UN forces were directly or indirectly or implied in, in the crimes. But when it comes to collection of documentary and other evidence, from states such as Serbia, uh, the 
best evidence coming from state institutions uh, came because of Yugoslav Tribunal as a court was founded in chapter seven, chapter on security uh, uh, of, of the UN that compelled every member state to, to cooperate. So when it comes to differences in international and national jurisdictions, my argument for international would prevail, not least because of access and possibility to compel states to cooperate. This cooperation, of course, didn't go very smoothly, and states would always find a way to avoid uh, cooperating fully, because as you know, states still are sacred cows of international criminal system, and a non-cooperative state will be by default protected by other democratic states because they might find themselves in the same position and be forced uh, documentation in a other uh, criminal procedure or mass atrocities. So the, there was also the understanding among states that they needed to protect each other from uh, international courts such as ICTY, but still uh, prosecution would have never succeeded in assembling so many documents from state archives, not just from Serbia and the states who were directly involved in the conflict, but from other, other states as well. So this would be my most compelling argument for international courts. There is that uh, definite uh, advantage in terms of collecting documentary evidence, uh, be precisely because the ICTY was a UN uh, charter-based court. Um, okay, and uh, Patrick, you also have, you have many experiences in other different countries uh, as well. So could you also um, compare, perhaps compare your experience from the previous experience from the ones you had at the ICTY? Uh, so I've been in five trials and I supported a sixth one. Uh, I was one of the co-authors of the expert report in the sixth one. And three were domestic, all three of those were in Guatemala. Then there were two trials at the ICTY, and then one in front of the Extraordinary African Chambers, which tried Hashan Habre, um, the former president of Chad. And my experience has been that as an expert, I, I, I have no ability whatsoever to comment on the jurisprudence or the quality of the legal reasoning or anything like that. But as an expert, I found it striking how variable judges are in terms of whether or not they care what the answer is. So when I give talks about statistics, I often ask at the beginning of the talk, I say, hey, you know, we all need to make graphs. How many of you care if the answer is right? And some hands go up and other people chuckle nervously. But many times people want a graph or a statistic, but they don't really care if the answer is right. Honestly, in the five trials I've testified in, in only one of them did I have the sense that the judges didn't really care what the answer was. In the others, it was striking how thoughtfully and carefully the judges questioned me. Um, they had, when they didn't understand something I was saying, they would either interrupt me or during their question period, they'd say, look, what are you trying to say here? What's the point of this? And they'd ask very subtle, very thoughtful uh, often very provocative questions that I had to answer. Those were the really good trials. And they were also, I think, the trials that produced, uh, well, of course, in the Milosevic, we don't have a finding, but they produced the best outcomes intellectually. We got to really good answers. But if the judges don't care what the answer is, and the prosecutor is unable to persuade them to care, you can get a bad outcome. And that that's also a problem. Even if the judge's legal reasoning may be very, very high quality, if they aren't willing to do something that's uncomfortable for them, and science is often uncomfortable for people who have not studied it, they will have a bad outcome. In this trial, the judge joked. Five minutes into my testimony, he told the joke, ah, <laughs> Dr. Ball, Dr. Ball, wait for a moment. Uh, you know, some of us studied the law because we were poor at math. 
Patrick, may, may I interrupt you? It certainly wasn't uh, Sir Jeffrey Nice, he was not judge as well, but he went to Oxford first uh, to, to read math, and yeah. he, he oh, never oh, no. studied law at Oxford, so... It wasn't they, Jeffrey this, Nice. This was elaborate, <laughs> no, no, this is what I noticed, this <laughs> elaborate way you were allowed to present your methodology comes from his genuine interest in yeah. mathematical no, he's an abstraction. exceptional lawyer. Sir Jeffrey got that when I explain this stuff to him, I have told the anecdote many times. I have never explained a complicated statistical argument to a non-statistician who understood it more quickly than Sir Jeffrey did. He got it in an instant and began asking very good questions right away. And I think that was what led to it. But also the judges in this case, all three of the judges, Judge May, Judge Kwan, Judge Robinson, all asked me challenging and thoughtful questions in the most which case. And so that, I think, led to a, a good and rich common understanding of what I was trying to argue. In this other case where the judge dismissed the math, in his finding, in fact, he made, correction, he made a series of findings that were unsupported by any actual scientific reasoning. He, the defense had another expert who said things that were absurd, that were completely non-scientific and would not have passed even the slightest bit of review, but that turns out to be the judge's finding because he didn't really want to think about the math. He wanted to dismiss it. So you have to think when you're, when you're in, a, in a judicial context, when I said as part of my preparatory materials for this, your audience are the judges. That's right. And if you can't persuade them, or if they don't want to be persuaded, as an expert, there's very little you can do. You're stuck. But, you know, I'm four for five. So in four of the five cases, we've had judges that really did want to know the answer and asked really good questions. I'm especially struck by this most recent case in front of the extraordinary African chambers where the argument was somewhat subtle and the judges asked, all three judges asked terrific questions. And in their findings, they wrote uh, very useful interpretations. They linked the scientific evidence to some of the legal and eyewitness evidence uh, and argument in a very thoughtful and interesting way that I had never foreseen before. So you can get really good outcomes, but it's, you know, you can also very occasionally, one time in five, get a bad outcome. Yeah, well, it, it's interesting listening to, to Patrick, and uh, uh, because, you know, when I, I was not expert witness, uh, but I worked uh, as a non-lawyer with lawyers, and very often they would tell me and uh, my colleagues from a team that was called leadership research team that was part of the prosecution, and we were asked for different trial teams to help lawyers and another team of non-lawyers and non-investigators with military analyst teams, the, the military experts who would guide lawyers and investigators in understanding military component, which was a huge component when it comes to, to implementation of the plan and, uh, and commission of mass atrocities, obviously, because military infrastructure. So it was interesting. Uh, Patrick was saying he was trying to convince judges, it was his audience. We from my team never tried to do it. I even, I didn't know the names of the judges. They were so far from me. I needed, I only needed to persuade my lawyer. And it was lawyer's skill then, and it was completely different skill to convince judges. And I would lose patience when we say, but judges wouldn't understand it. They say, what do I care? I understand it. And I'm telling you what I understand. So use your legal skills rhetoric to convince them. So if you felt that you were, that you were communicating with judges, you were missing a very able lawyer in between to translate your language through his or her questions to the judges. So I wouldn't go immediately to address judges, I would first go and say, hey, lawyer, you are having, as a prosecution lawyer, it, it is, um, you are soliciting testimony from me, I'm your witness, so you should know what you want judges to know. And, and that was fascinating and interesting filter for all of us who basically had the same goal, that the most important arguments were heard in the courtroom, but without very skillful uh, legal, uh, 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 technical language between the witness and the judges, there is no success. 
so Patrick, you mentioned you're, you have, you're kind of focused on the judges when you were making your presentations, but I assume that you definitely um, discussed the matter with the lawyers, uh, to specifically the prosecutors, before, when, before the, you made the testimonies, and how, how did that work out? Uh, different, different court contexts have different ways that that happens. Uh, in, uh, my, in the context of the Milosevic case, I worked pretty closely, and I had several meetings with uh, Sir Jeffrey and with others in the team, and we exp I explained everything, and people got it very quickly, people understood the argument, and indeed, there, in court, I was led, I was very ably led uh, in, in, the, in my direct, uh, in my direct testimony. Um, that's not always how it works. Uh, in other legal contexts, I've had very little, cont very little discussion with the prosecutors, maybe only 10 or 15 minutes, uh, and it's not clear to me if they understand what I'm saying, or maybe they do. Uh, well, I mean, it's, it's both not good and good. I mean, in some sense, as a scientist, my job is not to support the prosecution. My job is to present the science. And so I'm actually comfortable with that context. Now, it leaves me very, very vulnerable if the defense starts saying things that are nonsense. When the defense like starts... No, like Milutinovic. I mean, Milosevic said crazy things, but Judge May was having none of it. Um, and, and I don't really think that was a huge risk. But in Milutinovic, the defense said crazy, ridiculous, nonsensical things, and the judge just took it as though it was reasonable. I mean, it was disastrous. From me, I mean, I understand there was a good legal outcome, but it was, it was disastrous for the scientific quality of the reasoning. And so that was, that was the one that really failed. In the Guatemalan cases, it's actually not actually the practice that you work that closely with the prosecutor. The prosecutor gives you a document that says this our hypotheses are, and then as a, as a, as a perito, giving a peritaje, you're presenting scientific findings that are independent of the prosecutor. And I like that model. Uh, I, I think that model's good, and so there my job is not necessarily to persuade the prosecutor. The prosecutor decides to call me, but my job is to then present the scientific expert results as science to the judges. And so I am, my job is to persuade the judges. In the Extraordinary African Chambers, it was also similar. I had relatively little contact, a little bit, but not very much, with the uh, prosecutor. And in fact, I, because of that, it was not an Anglo-American uh, adversarial system, but rather a continental system, my connection was with the investigative judges rather than with the prosecutor. And so the investigative judges, who were also a neutral party in the, in, the, in the trial, were the ones who said, look, these are the things that we want you to speak to. And I said, okay, I can speak to this, this, and this, but not this, but how about this? And they said, okay, yeah, do these pieces. And we agreed on the general structure of what I would present, and then I sent them the expert report, and then I showed up in court you know, a year later. So it's, I think different, tr different court structures have different rules about the way the expert and the prosecutors work together. Um, yeah. I'm also curious, like, uh, for example, uh, like crimes against humanity has certain defini legal definition and the prosecution, it is on, the prosecution has the burden to prove that those uh, elements were fulfilled. And uh, when you, uh, when either of you were actually working on uh, collecting evidence or presenting evidence, did you actually have that kind of legal issue in mind or was it something that was just left to the lawyers to figure out? Before, uh, well, one of the um, thing is when you start working at um, a court dealing with mass atrocities and if you are a non-lawyer, you come to work there without any pre-knowledge. There is no training you once get a job there. Uh, you, you get odd tasks and you have no idea where you're heading at. I remember my first day coming to the office in May 2000. I got a chair and computer and they say you are working on a Bosnian part of indictment for Milosevic. And I said, okay, no guidance, nothing. So this a widespread systematic, which I later understood just because I was so bluntly honest about my ignorance. I would send email to a team of 150 people and say, what is that? And people would come to me and say, weren't you embarrassed? I said, no, I would be more embarrassed to work without knowing it. So, you know, I asked and I got the answers. So, um, for non-lawyers, it's a hard way 
to learn these things, but then it's easy because you learn for practice. You hear things at the meetings and you are sent in the field and you have to know for yourself because you can overwork. You can be all over the place while you can focus yourself. So talking about widespread and systematic with a test of proof beyond reasonable doubt, by the way, that's what, what I've learned immediately as well, is um, the, the uh, standard of proof for uh, crimes against humanity opposed to genocide where you have to prove intent uh, to destroy in part or in whole a group of ethnic, religious, and so forth. Um, so what, what do you do with this? Well, to connect it with Patrick's expert testimony, I remember when he came to testify or when he went to visit several times, my team was called to listen to his lecture. So he had a lecture and it was, of course, uh, not mandatory. Anyone could come working on Milosevic case, and of course I came. I was in the audience, it was a small audience, remember this uh, room uh, in the circle, and I remember him talk, and I remember talking to Sir Jeffrey and other lawyers about it afterwards. He gave us, from all these uh, interesting statistics you now show, uh, as ever seen, uh, probabilities and so forth, he actually gave us very concrete dates where he saw the mo huge movements of Kosovo population leaving, uh, leaving Kosovo. And that st stuck in our minds. And this is why this widespread and systematic comes from many, many places. And you uh, as a lawyer and non-lawyer, you then very easily recognize corroboration of this evidence from other places. So Patrick and I talked this morning about development of evidence and during the defense part of the case, uh, there was a Colonel Vladko Vukovic who was uh, um, then uh, part of uh, uh, Yugoslav army, uh, and we got hold of his wartime diary. And this widespread and systematic that we already knew from statistics, without Patrick even being there at all these different places, we saw the movements of people. And then you read it in the wartime diary, where this colonel is mentioning exactly the same places, exactly the same dates, and at the end of every page, he would write 1,000 expelled. Next page, 1,500 expelled. So yeah, widespread uh, and systematic comes not only from one place, it comes, if you know what you're looking for, you recognize it in almost every evidence, including, of course, uh, victim uh, statements, testimonies, testimonies, and so forth. But another thing what Sir Jeffrey was saying, and I think that is maybe what Ethan was referring to in the first place, was how do I prove it? How much is enough? For Milosevic case, and I think Judge Kwon is, uh, is mis mischievously um, grinning about that, because I do think there was a huge, there, there was, difference in approach that judges would have liked to see from Milosevic case uh, because, as Judge May said, you can't have so many witnesses, you can't have so many crime scenes, but we had to. Why? Tomorrow I will show you uh, maps of uh, counts in Milosevic case. There were 66 counts spread over three different conflicts in time and geographic area. And if we needed to prove and widespread and systematic and intent, because we had genocide charges as well. And if we wanted to show that all three wars are part of the same criminal intersection to create post-Yugoslav Serbian state that extended its borders to the West in the areas where Serbs were never majority, but that these territories had to be conquered, we needed to include as many counts as we could, because geographically and in time, we had to prove that it was not one-time mistake that people were killed. But 
that was premeditated plan. So we were including all counts that would cover this geography. But then the question would be, each count had sometimes 15 charges. And that becomes then a problem. If you want to prove all the charges within one count, you would have for each count, each geographical place, 20 witnesses. So we lost some charges, but we hardly lost count. And this was our calculation. Do not lose count, lose charges if it's necessary to lose. So I hope it's not too technical, too complicated, and I hope Judge Kwon would be able to, to reply to this. Perhaps we should invite Judge Kwon to a short explanation, but no, no it's all right. <laughs> Just, uh, so Patrick, did you also have, the, have this kind of prior legal knowledge that helped in your putting together your evidence? Uh, no, uh, no, not at all. Uh, and to this day, I, I, I don't really understand most of the law. Um, and I don't really think it's my job to do so. Uh, what, what my job is to do, is, and this is very often the position statisticians are in, is that statisticians very often are working with substantive experts in other fields. We're working with biologists, we're working with survey people, we're working with um, people doing medical experiments. And our job is to figure out what is the question these people are trying to figure out? What is the fact that, these, that, the, that our, our counterparts, our partners, need to understand? And so we have to listen to them, listen through their substantive complexities and figure out what's the question. So uh, I'll talk, I'm, I'm not sure if it's tomorrow or in, in my other session, I'll talk about what did genocide mean to a statistician? Now, genocide has all kinds of complicated legal meanings. But to a statistician, genocide means, okay, you have this area, and a lot of people got killed. But not just a lot of people. People of this kind did get killed, and people of that kind did not get killed. You need a big difference in the rate of killing between these two people. Now, that's not a legal definition by any means. In fact, I've heard lawyers argue to me that you can have a charge of genocide without anybody getting killed. Maybe so, maybe not. But for a statistician, this notion of the difference in the killing rate, what a statistician would call a relative risk, is for us a, a, a useful index or indicia of genocide. So in the case in Guatemala, we showed that for an indigenous person living in the three counties in which uh, the prosecution alleged that the army had committed genocide, the probability of being killed was eight times greater than for a non-indigenous person living in the same place. Okay? So the relative risk is a factor of eight. Now, that took something like 11 years of research to come up with, but that little statistic is not proof of genocide. And I would point out that none of the statistical reasoning I've presented in any of these cases is proof. It's all circumstantial. Mm. It's all the kind of pattern we would expect if the prosecution's hypotheses are true. If, the pro if what the prosecution is alleging are true, these are the statistics we would expect to see. We see them. That adds a little bit of weight to what the prosecutor is saying. But it is not proof. And it's not proof because there may be some other pattern that we have not considered which could explain the same observations we make in reality. This is a very complicated sort of epistemological problem. And in fact, was one of, it was, it, it, as I've reread the transcript from the Militinovich case several times, it was the heart of the misunderstanding between the prosecutors, the judges, and me it, that led to such a bad outcome in that one case. The judges thought I was there to prove something. What I was really there to do is disprove something. Statistics is excellent at showing that an explanation could not be true. Indeed, it could not be the case that the killings in Yugoslavia were caused uh, by NATO. It could not be the case that the killings in uh, Kosovo, excuse me, were caused by the KLA. Those explanations we can reject because we can show that the patterns of bombing and the pattern of KLA activity were completely inconsistent with the patterns of, of homicide. So it was impossible that those two uh, actors caused the killing. We did not prove that Yugoslav forces committed those killings. We could observe some very interesting coincidences 
So I hope you'll stick around for the afternoon, and I will, in fact, make those observations. But we can't prove things. And statistics is not really in the business of proving things. Uh, so we're in the business of disproving things. And I think that's also very useful in prosecutions. And when we're at our best, we're able to get the uh, the, the, we're able to convince the prosecutors and the judges that, hey, this is a way of narrowing down what the debate can be. Years and years ago, back in the 90s, uh, a guy who was then a, a, a scholar of transitional justice and has since become a Canadian politician, Michael Ignatiev, once wrote that the purpose of truth commissions is not to establish the truth. The purpose of truth commissions is to narrow the range of permissible lies. And I think that very often expert testimony in these trials is of the same kind. We are there to narrow the range of permissible lies. And this enables the prosecutors to get much closer to the truth. We narrow the kinds of nonsense that the defense can throw out. So I add that as a kind of complex, a roundabout way to, to make that point. Um, but Statistics should never be the only thing prosecutions are presenting. And of course, in none of these trials is it the only thing. I, I think that statistics in human rights work is a footnote. It's not the headline. It's not the lead paragraph. It's a footnote. But it's a really important footnote, and it has to be right. It's a footnote that sets a big picture, that narrows the range of permissible lies, that gets us close to the story. As Nana said, it, it gave them a starting point that then they could investigate more deeply and show something like finding uh, at one of the perpetrator's war diaries. Or saying, hey, we're looking for people who were expelled from Kosovo between the 10th and the, uh, and, the, and the 17th of April. That was a huge wave. Let's go look for those people. Because there weren't so many people before the 7th. In fact, from the 4th to the 7th, no one left Kosovo. 4th of 7th of April, 1999. So I hope that's somewhat illuminating. Yeah, it's very interesting that you say statistics is a circumstantial, somewhat negative, it provides a negative explanation for basically uh, disproving things that uh, so some of the claims made by the defense or other uh, human rights abusers. Uh, nevertheless, I would say, uh, if see, as we've seen from the movie clip, the defense will try to uh, argue, counter your arguments at court and outside. and. Uh, uh, how, how did you did you how did you prepare yourself for the cross examination from Milosevic or Miltonovic or other um, defendants? Well, in Milosevic, uh, because I was very well prepped by the prosecution team, I had a good sense of the kinds of things that were likely to be said, and, and I thought I was very very well prepared. Um, and. The next trial I was in, the Militinovich case, I was much less well prepared. I was not prepared for people saying things that were scientifically meaningless or ridiculous or nonsensical. It had not occurred to me that we were going to leave the bounds of logic and say things that were nonsense and that the lawyers would say these things with earnest, reasonable voices and straight faces. And they were mathematically meaningless, absolutely absurd. And I was unable, during the course of that, to explain how absurd and meaningless the things that were said were. And then the defense brought a defense expert who said things that were completely and meaninglessly absurd. How do you respond to that? I'm not actually, even to this day, what, 11, 10, 11 years later, I'm not entirely sure how to respond to it. But I think that Ben is right. You have to coordinate with the prosecutor. You need to enable the prosecutor to cross-examine that kind of uh, nonsense more effectively than we did. And so if I've learned something, it's that I have to work more closely with the prosecutor when I can. It's not always possible. As I said, in, in, the, in the Guatemalan context and in the uh, extraordinary African chambers, it wasn't really available. Uh, that's not really how those courts work. So we got lucky. So Nina, when, when, uh, when Patrick was taking stand and Milosevic basically told him, like, it's a, it's a fabricated figure. Did you expect that, or I mean, did you prepare for that kind of situation as a member of the prosecution? Oh, well, um, in such cases when uh, any accused representing himself uh, goes beyond legal narrative and language, prosecution hardly needed to intervene because it was obvious the judges would make up their mind. But different thing is when a defendant is represented by professional lawyers 
And if you are prosecutor and you have, we call it testimony in chief, if we call an expert, is prosecution called an expert, testimony in chief was so important because it lays the ground for important factual determinations. So you don't leave the other side ruin your witness or credibility of the evidence. So it would not, be, expert witness like Patrick and any other should be so confident sitting in, at, at, in his chair or her chair, knowing that prosecution would object and lead the evidence back into the court and so that the judges might have easier way to make determinations. So we were never too concerned about Milosevic going too far because it was so obvious what, is, what was he doing. And uh, I remember Sir Jeffrey always telling us, don't fret if I sit and do not object too much because if I object too much, it would be like Goliath against David. Let him go and make all this nonsensical observation himself, I would sit in my chair. So he would, he would warn us because it was definitely his strategy. But it wouldn't be his strategy if the accused would be represented, or many accuses in Milutinovich's case, by different lawyers, then prosecution would uh, try to, to go back to the very strict rules, what is permissible, what is not, and not protect a witness, but protect the integrity of the evidence, because testimony in chief is very important because it shows what the strategy, the case of prosecution is, what factual basis uh, prosecution is relying upon. But to go back to Patrick's uh, mixed feelings about um, his uh, 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 expertise at two different courses, ICTY, if I may, I would make a very general observation uh, starting with, again, yet another disclaimer that I'm a huge admirer of uh, demographers who worked uh, at the ICTY, certainly an expert witnesses and our permanent prosecution team consisting of a formidable lady, Eva Tabo. Uh, because what happened with all of them, and I worked very closely to them, to Eva, and I will show you in my presentation some of immensely valuable discoveries about conflict just done by, by um, rigorous uh, scrutiny of available data on demography, is that demographers, experts moved the statistics and demographies and human losses during the armed conflict to a completely new dimension. And as Eva Tabo would inform me, and we talked a lot about it, they now understand that there is no understanding without contextualization. And at the beginning, I think Patrick, but certainly not Eva, didn't even dare to put any of their data in a political and historical context. At certain point, you all realized that it's necessary. And this is a huge contribution which might not be readily understood and available to people who are not intimately part of the, of, of the developments. How do you present? the best figures, not to the judges, to the victims, and basically to world citizens, because now we all care what's happening with mass atrocities. And what statistics brought in the, uh, through legal process, I don't think the statistics would have been developed in such a pace if it were not for international criminal trials, because they were suddenly asked. We, we had three or four statisticians demographers working at the prosecution for now 25 years. It's a huge human capital that now needs to be made available to the world to understand what it is. And, and I think it puts development of statistics in a, at a higher and, and good, good level to be and to be shared with non-mathematicians as well. So that, that was, uh, I think, one of the huge uh, impacts and results of, of criminal procedures we had.
And I just mentioned about the world citizens and how they view about the trial as well. And uh, I kind of want to pivot to, we, we've been talking so, so far about the things that are happening inside the court. Uh, but uh, I guess you also had in mind the court of public opinion outside the courtroom. And uh, I, think, uh, I think, Patrick, you said at the end of the clip, very end of the clip, that the judges and the audience, they're the ones who, that you care about. And you specifically mentioned the audience. And uh, I believe Just Jeffrey Nice also referred to the, the kind of evidence that will stand the test of time, which kind of uh, something that Judge Kwan referred to this morning, citing uh, Robert Jackson from Nuremberg. Uh, so when you, you, when you are presenting or preparing uh, the evidence, uh, how did the, uh, I'm sure you had the, the, the public opinion in mind as well. So. How did that figure into your uh, preparation and uh, presentation? Maybe Nina can go first. Once you work at uh, such a complex and uh, high profile case, Slobodan Milosevic, you don't have time to think even about judges, let alone our audience, because you are always working on yesterday's deadlines. So uh, that does not concern you at this point very much, but what was so interesting when the trial finished by a premature death of the defendant, uh, I suddenly had more time to look what's going on because when you work when things become so obvious to you, you think that the whole world understands them and the whole world follows it. And then I understood, first of all, that the international criminal justice system, criminal justice system uh, was so readily accepted by liberal world citizens, not just the victim communities immediately, but they had huge, very unrealistic expectations. I don't know where these expectations came from, but uh, official ICTY sites certainly didn't help to temper them because in their first days and years they announced the end of impunity, um, end of mass atrocities and so forth, et cetera. That was a goal, actually. Yeah, but then, but then they, they changed it, obviously, because if you read any um, justice department and national jurisdiction what their mandate is, they would never say, we are going to extinguish crimes ever, forever. The, the only expectations we can have is to control crimes, because political violence with, is with us since people uh, form some sort of political entities. So we won't extinguish it. So whatever we do, we need to find ways to control it. But this language, this rhetoric actually made everyone expect miracles, and then very quickly. So this was the first thing that I realized that audience uh, expects too much. Second thing that I noticed when I started reading articles and reactions of people, that, uh, that there is such a legal uh, illiteracy among the general audience, and certainly victims audience, uh, for example, if you would tell uh, associations of victims, like mothers of Srebrenica or former prisoners of war in Bosnia, that of course some of the people were acquitted and should be acquitted because of procedural issues uh, and breaches of I don't know what, they would never accept it. They said, we don't care. The law can be broken, the regulations can be broken, he or she is guilty, we want him or her to hang. So there was some sort of expectation of expediency that would bring result and not respect of the highest norms of a legal system. So, and then thirdly, what was interesting for me is that the longer I followed the works of ICTY, you do understand that slow justice might not be justice at all. Because after 25 years, you have so many people who already died waiting for interesting verdicts. Secondly, you have verdicts that were utterly unsatisfactory for the audience who is there. So 
coming back to if, if we would be able to start all over again, I think from my experience, the good remedy would be to make outreach program of the ICTY as big as numbers and endeavors as the prosecution. It was almost like each prosecutor should be shadowed by outreach officer to explain what has been done and that the communication and interaction between defense and prosecution and, and, and judges uh, should be displayed in a much more transparent way towards the audience. When I worked for the prosecution, we were so scared off to talk to defense people of judges that I hardly dared to greet them because I thought I was breaking some sacred law. It was nonsense. You can be very professional talking to defense, uh, defense lawyer without breaching any, any law, but it was some sort of spastic uh, um, fear of anxiety that we should be so confidential that it actually hurt the, the institution in a way. There could be possible room for conflict of interest as well, so I don't know. But, uh. Yeah, but these, these happen anyway behind the closed doors. If I have a dinner with a defense lawyer and everyone can see me, I prefer that than you know, lack of transparency and then bad things happening anyway. So uh, transparency is a huge, huge achievement of, of our democracy, and it should not be shortcut for some cosmetic or artificial uh, 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 purposes of, uh, of, of objectivity or impartiality, because you certainly can work on outreach, and you can work on out outreach only when you include all the parties. Outreach shouldn't come just for from the prosecution. Outreach shouldn't come just from the judges. It should be a joint effort to understand what is actually happening in such institutions. So the outreach would be my, my first uh, attempt to improve the system. But also when you are actually presenting evidence in the courtroom, uh, or the instances where you had not just that you or Geoffrey Nice had uh, not just the judges, but also the larger audience in mind as well? I can think of like, for example, some video footage that was played during the one of the cross one of the cross examination. That well, uh, you are talking about the Scorpion video. We are, we are going to talk it uh, during my presentation in uh, greater detail. But this is a fascinating story, and this story was certainly not done to influence outside world politicians. It was done for for many internal. Uh, reasons and I don't know whether it's a good moment to tell you the whole story but Sir Jeffrey Nice showed that video without even informing the chief prosecutor at the time mm. and uh, and the only person who used it for self-promotion was chief prosecutor Carla del Ponte but she even didn't know what the team was doing and the reason why Sir Jeffrey used it is following. Milosevic um, defense case started at the end of August 2014. Uh, four, sorry. And uh, at uh, 13 of September, we registered this video in our evidences. And how we registered it? So we got it after prosecution part of the case. So we couldn't present it in, a, in, a, in chief through a witness, a prosecution witness. So if you do that, you are in trouble as prosecution because such an important evidence cannot be used just like that in a defense part of the case. Mm -hmm. Why? Because you always have to, to uh, uh, show authenticity of, of the evidence, uh, integrity of the source where you got it, or originator, all sort of things, and in cross-examination, if you use it, you, you don't have time to establish the basis for it. Mm -hmm. So we knew that judges would never accept it as evidence. Mm -hmm. And yet, because we got it in such a late stage, Sir Jeffrey thought and knew if he doesn't show it, it will stain the integrity of the trial, mm -hmm. because it was at the ICTY. And the story how we got it is a fascinating story. 
because one of our investigators got a telephone call from a former witness, a lawyer, Bosnian Muslim lawyer from Tuzla in Bosnia and Herzegovina. And he said, I have a client who wants to sell you a piece of evidence. And ICTY is not allowed to buy evidence. So the, the investigator goes back and he says, well, we can't buy anything before we see it. So the lawyer gives him the tape and he sees what's in it and he goes like, oh my God, what is this? So he makes a copy, gives it back to the lawyer, said, no, we are not interested. So we didn't buy it. But we have it in database. And this immensely important general, Obrad Stevanovic, a MUP general, Ministry of Internal Affairs of Serbia, uh, who has made his whole career in Kosovo. And during the Kosovo War, he is very high up in the hierarchy, uh, being um, in charge of, uh, of uh, different units, uh, of, uh, of a unit um, uh, for anti-terrorist uh, actions. And he brings about 300 files as defense evidence showing all sorts of crimes committed by so-called KLA, as they call it, so-called Kosovo Liberation Army. And Sir Jeffrey comes to us and he says, he and another general, uh, Boži Dardelic, could actually undermine our Kosovo case. So we need everything possible to attack their credibility. And as a prosecution, we can use so many documents, so many uh, things we didn't show in prosecution case for undermining credibility. So this was our path to show it. So first of all, Sir Jeffrey thought we cannot possibly face the world after the end of the trial when it appeared that this video was already in our database without showing it. Secondly, yes, we can use it completely to shake up Obraz Stevanovic because he can undermine Kosovo part of the case. So we did it. But what happened later outside of a courtroom was be beyond our uh, power because chief prosecutor that year, Carla Del Ponte, was nominated with another, with Natasha Kandic as a Nobel Prize uh, candidate for peace while she saw it for the first time from her office watching it on the, on the TV screen. But for whatever, we, we of course, it never became evidence in Milosevic case because we uh, judges rightly said that there would be needed to establish foundation. And, but what was so important that that single video triggered the most important post-conflict debate about responsibility in Serbia for the crimes in Bosnia and Herzegovina. So in a way, I call it transformative uh, value of, of trial evidence that sometimes these sort of trials are important just because they made for general public uh, 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 known the, 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 the details who and how committed the crimes. And I think that was absolutely immensely uh, important value of this piece of evidence. Thank you for the behind the scenes story as well. Um, uh, for the audience, the, the Scorpion video that we mentioned, it's, uh, it's actually about a two hour footage of uh, basically Serb militia forces massacring uh, people in uh, Srebrenica. Serb uh, that, that was initially played in the, at the court. And then it was uh, played by, it was aired in the Serbian uh, TV networks, which, ca which caused this national debate in Serbia about uh, its responsibility during the conflict. Um, so, Patrick, do you also have, uh, so did you also, did, was the public perception a big factor in your preparation or, 
presentation of your ed evidence as well. You, you have your, you had experience in the truth commissions in El Salvador as well, so it's uh, something. Yes. Yeah. I would like to talk to that, but I wonder, is that my close, or are we about to end, or do we have a bit more? Okay, yes. then I would no. like to ask if you could punt to her, and I'll excuse myself for just a second. Oh, sure, uh, okay. Oh, um. all right. Uh, Sure, yeah, let's go to the, move on to the next question. So we've talked about the public perception, uh, uh, but uh, we also have a lot of, uh, a, lot of uh, a lot of civil society organizations, uh, people from, uh, from NGOs uh, seated here. And uh, I understand that they also have, the NGOs or civil society has some role to play in the collection or preparation of evidence uh, as well. And uh, what 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 would be like things to consider uh, when the NGOs uh, have this uh, come across this kind of evidence that might play crucial later on, uh, or maybe perhaps something things that they should not do if they come across such uh, evidence. Um, NGOs played very important role and for the establishment of the International Criminal Tribunal for former Yugoslavia, as all other legal institutions later on. But um, as for collection of evidence, and for Kosovo, and for Bosnia, uh, the reports by uh, uh, Human Rights Watch were used extensively. Um, and why and how uh, these people were already working on investigation and recording uh, of the crimes uh, on the ground before tribunal started. So uh, we are talking about contemporaneously recorded um, crimes. They did extensive um, uh, interviews with uh, eyewitnesses, victims, even perpetrators, which um, were safely stored. And some of them, like Fred Abrahams from Human Rights Watch, was very important fact witness for the crimes happening in Kosovo in 98 and 99. But more importantly, why human rights organizations' work was important for, for um, defendants like Slobodan Milosevic, uh, politicians in charge, is that every time they produced a report of breaches of human rights, they actually officially send it to relevant ministries uh, and very often to uh, Office of Slobodan Milosevic, and that was very important for prosecutions for evid notice evidence, putting politicians on notice. Uh, Jerry Labor was another person whose evidence was immensely important for us, who would say that uh, they warned politicians in Serbia what was happening in Bosnia and Herzegovina. And once politicians were put on notice, and if nothing changes, if the crimes continue to happen, that was a great evidence in the court for, for the prosecution. So their reports were used, uh, human rights researchers were used uh, or asked to be fact witnesses. Sometimes they were just used to help investigators in the office to sort out evidence. But once we would, uh, prosecution would get, for example, a report in, in evidence, in the footnotes you would see the protective names of the witnesses. So if we wanted to go back to the original file, of, we needed to ask special permission. So the confidentiality of uh, of, of uh, research of human rights uh, organization needed to be uh, uh, to to be upheld because of um, uh, of their future work because when they work with the, with the people on the field 
everyone who would speak to them should know that in no circumstances their identity would be disclosed. And these are very complicated, very technical um, rules that needed to be respected from all possible sides. So were there, are there certain uh, things that the NGOs or civil society will have to keep in mind when they collect evidence? Uh, I guess this question got, kind of goes to both of you. I mean, so that it is actually presentable in the court, that uh, it, it is something that it will, not, it will not be challenged by the defense or uh, basically, uh, so what, what will be like the basic rules that uh, the NGOs will have to keep in mind uh, when they're preparing this kind of evidence for later uh, trials? Um, in several of the cases that I've been in, we've gotten a kind of special ruling from the judges that um, what we're presenting will not have the same kind of chain of evidence that other kinds of evidence will have, uh, that we're putting together a, uh, a story that involves collecting thousands or tens of thousands of individual stories which we may not have uh, available in some sort of way that could be interrogated by the defense. And so the challenge by the defense has to be a more technical challenge rather than a case-by-case, data-by-data, page-by-page kind of challenge. Um, and I think that that's probably appropriate for statistical evidence. It doesn't strike me that it's going to be feasible to have every deposition in a giant crate uh, behind the expert when he or she presents the results. That's just not really going to work out. Instead, the kinds of critiques that a defense expert could bring would be about the methods that were used, about whether or not the methods are appropriate, whether or not the, uh, the results say what the expert, the prosecution's expert, actually says the results say. Statistical evidence may be subject to complicated interpretation. And so maybe it doesn't say what the expert's saying, but says something else. Um, one kind of analysis that I would also recommend that both prosecution experts and defense experts who are using statistical claims do is called sensitivity analysis. And in this, uh, I did quite a bit of this in my expert testimony uh, in all the cases in which we say, well, you know, we have the evidence here of, say, in the, in the Guatemalan cases, we are using uh, something like 20, 22, 23,000 individual testimonies are part of what we're uh, presenting here. Some of them are probably lies. They're not all true. I'm sure they're not all true. How many of them have to be wrong before the result changes? That's the statistician's claim, or the concern. The statistician doesn't ask, are they all perfect? I know they're not all perfect. Some of them are wrong, most of them are right. Where's the line? Now I'm making a claim, going back to the Guatemalan case, you guys may, have, may recall that what I was arguing is that the relative risk of being killed for an indigenous person was eight times greater than for a non-indigenous person. And I found that to be consistent with the prosecution's claim that acts of genocide were committed in these three counties of Guatemala. How many of the testimonies that we used as the foundation for our report would have to have been falsehoods in order for that result to change in any meaningful way? Okay? And so we could subject that by deleting some of them, by changing some of them, by perturbing the data is the way a statistician talks about it. How much can the data be perturbed and still get to the conclusion that is consistent with the prosecution's claim? So rather than fighting about an individual case, we say, what is the big picture? How much do we think is plausible? Do we think that 20% of these are lies? Are 30% of them lies? And it turns out, because of the way the math works and because of the way the whole calculation works, most of our findings are robust, which means we make the same finding even if 20% of them are lies, which is quite extraordinary, right? Because the results are not a close call for the most part. So we can have enormous amounts of garbage in our system and still get a clear answer. And we can make different kinds of assumptions about what kinds of garbage it is and still check to see if the answer is, continues to be, to be solid. And that's the kind of way a statistician approaches this problem. Again, I think it's quite different than the way a journalist or a field analyst or a lawyer might approach it where you're worrying about each case, each story. 
we're not worried about each story. We know some of the stories we get are not true. Does it matter? Well, it depends how many of them there are. Let's check. Let's test that. Let's measure it. Let's rerun the models, see if they still hold. I guess the big numbers or the statistical method methodology helps in that aspect to get at the more uh, fuller picture of the events. The analogy, I, sorry, the analogy that I used in court is that uh, doing statistics is like listening to your friend talk to you in a crowded bar. The, the people are talking and lots of people are talking and there's lots of noise. Can you still hear your friend? Can you still make out what your friend is saying? Well, the answer is maybe, right? It depends how loud the bar is. It depends how clear your friend's voice is. It depends if you, if you have a pretty good theory about what your friend's saying. If you kind of know what your friend's saying, it's easier to hear what she's trying to tell you. You know, there's lots of things that go into your ability to make out the signal from the noise. And that analogy is actually quite good. There's, there's ways that that represents many of the problems of understanding a signal, uh, you know, a statistical pattern in the midst of noisy uh, and partial data. Okay, so, <clears throat> okay, so in the remaining 20 minutes, uh, we will take questions written. Question that I punted before on audience. So, oh, uh, sorry, because I ran off. Might, maybe now, now is the time to, yeah, for. <laughs> That's yeah, great. To, um, that one. When scientists do a, do a project, uh, we, we don't generally do it once. We'll do it over and over and over again, trying to figure out if additional data or a different method or some other approach yields the same result. And for most of the cases that we've done, the case that I present in court is usually the third or fourth or fifth version of that project I've done, and I may do more after that case. Um, each of those projects probably has a different kind of audience. And so some of those audiences are truth commissions, some of those audiences are public reports, some of those audiences are chapters in the book that Human Rights Watch wrote about Kosovo after the trial. I mean, there were, there were a series of outcomes. And so when we think about an audience, the specific way we frame a piece of expert testimony is to try to address some point that we understand the prosecution to be arguing. And we frame it in a way that we think is appropriate for court as best we can. But we may also write a scientific article about it and publish in a scientific journal, or we'll uh, make a public report with lots of glossy pictures, uh, or a website, uh, or an interactive, uh, some sort of interactive tool, or in the Kosovo case, we published the data sets. And this turned out to be crucial because the data sets we published for Kosovo have been used in many, many academic studies uh, and dissertations and, and, and academic uh, scientific articles and so forth. And so there's lots of different ways, different kinds of audiences when you're doing scientific work in this context that you can present it. And I think they're all valuable. Um, and we shouldn't give up on any of them.